maybe 95% of what we do, we do somewhat unconsciously, somewhat without awareness and without a lot of reflection. And really only about 5% or so of the decisions we make are made with a lot of conscious deliberation and rational choice. percent that's a really small number like we kind of tell ourselves that we're rational and that we put a lot of thought into our decisions but i guess that's kind of wrong isn't it well some of what that five percent is doing is trying to explain or make sense of the other 95 percent right maybe sometimes creating the illusion that we're making conscious rational choices when really what we're doing is just trying to make sense of doing something that we did without a lot of awareness or intention in, at all. This, this is actually really relevant in a consumer context because one of the things we talk about in consumer behavior quite a bit is the concept of cognitive dissonance. The idea that it's really important for marketers to make consumers feel good about the choices that they make. And there's so many reasons for that. When we make choices about consumer products, we make choices about brands, we often have a lot of options. Sometimes we have a lot of information. Sometimes we don't have a lot of information. Um, sometimes the decision is very difficult. Sometimes it's not. So there are all these factors that play into decision difficulty. And the more important the decision is, the more choices that we have, the more time, energy, and effort that we put into the decision, the more likely that we're going to worry about whether we made the right decision or not. And so... One of the ways this comes into play is that the, the consumer mind does a very good job of helping us feel like we've made the right decision, even if sometimes we're not so sure. A lot of consumer marketing is based on the idea that marketers aren't just trying to help consumers figure out what they should do. It's also about trying to make consumers feel like what they did was the right thing to do. What are some things businesses can do to help ease people's buyer's remorse? This is one of the reasons why companies will offer product trials, limited or extended warranties on products, anything that a company can do to reassure the consumer that they've made the right decision, but also on the front end of the buying process, make them feel like it's uh, like they have recourse if they don't make the right decision. Maybe they can take it back. Maybe they can get it fixed if it breaks at no cost. Uh, and honestly, one of the reasons why companies do that is that simply by offering those options to consumers, they, they make consumers feel better about their choice in a way that often means those services are less likely to be utilized. Just knowing that you can take something back or that you can try it for free without committing might make it easier for you to go ahead and pull the trigger and make the purchase and feel good about it, even if you don't take it back or take advantage of the extended warranty. How much does people telling themselves their own story kind of play into their their purchase? Like so like if there's not enough information, you know, there's a lot of studies that show we'll fill in that information with our own thoughts and our own stories. Where do you see that playing into their purchasing behavior? The, a brand communicates a lot of things to a consumer. A, a brand carries a great deal of meaning for the company, right? The company's history is wrapped up in the brand. The, the, the company's uh, product quality is wrapped up in the brand. These are components of what we might call brand equity. The idea that Brands are valuable and we can place, we can calculate even the value of a brand based on things like the extent to which consumers are aware of the company and the extent to which the company has a history of customer satisfaction. But part of that isn't just, doesn't just reside within the company. And part of it is not just within the company or the organization's ability to control. A lot of it is in the mind of the consumer. So the associations that the consumer has with the brand. Coca-Cola is a great example. If you, if you wanted to have a conversation about what makes the Coca-Cola brand valuable, well, part of it is awareness. It's one of the truly global brands, maybe one of the first truly global brands that everybody around the world recognizes. Um, that comes along with a great deal of history and a certain assurance of uh, a consistent and high quality product that 
is going to be the same or at least similar. There are some differences in formulation, uh, no matter where you get it, right? But part of that is also dependent on the consumer's own personal experiences with the brand, right? What are the associations that the consumer makes to Coca-Cola? In what settings has the consumer experienced Coca-Cola? What does the consumer remember about uh, having been exposed to Coca-Cola marketing messages that might make them think about Christmas, for instance, or the idea of American freedom, which is one of the ways that Coca-Cola really built a global brand in the, in the post-World War II era. So our own personal stories, our own personal identities end up sort of baked into brand equity in a lot of ways, which is one of the reasons why understanding consumer psychology is so important because, right, there are some things that you control when it comes to determining the value of your brand. You can spend a great deal of money trying to create awareness. You can construct uh, powerful messages that pair that brand with good feelings and positive imagery and other sorts of things that will make people feel favorably towards the brand. But what you can't control is ultimately the way that that's going to connect with each individual consumer and their own experiences, their own stories, their own personal identity. What you can do is try to understand what that is and make sure that the message that you're communicating is consistent with it in a way that makes sense for the kind of consumer that you're most likely to be trying to communicate with in your in your target market segments. You bring up consistency. Why is it so important from, from a psychological perspective? So branding really gets off the ground in the early 20th century. I, I guess you could say brands have been around forever in some way or another. There's always been artisans who have had products to sell and in that way, the brand is very personal, right? It's the brand is the local baker that makes the exactly the kind of bread that I love and that I want to buy every day. What happens in the late 19th and early 20th century is the Industrial Revolution gets off the ground. And all of these consumer products, these consumer goods that we used to have to get locally, right? Clothing from the local tailor, bread from the local baker, it all starts to become industrialized, mechanized, mass produced. And what happens is it becomes much more impersonal than ever before. And the companies that really started to leverage and capitalize on these technologies were very worried about what, what does it mean for a consumer to not have that relationship with the person who's making their clothes or the person that's baking their bread. And you get the Quaker Oats Man. So what is the Quaker Oats Man? It's basically the personification of the trustworthy, reliable guy who lives in town and grows your grains. Now we're putting his face on the product so you can feel that it's just as personable and trustworthy of a product as you could count on getting from the guy down the street that you actually personally know. It's been well, like 30 years since they've had commercials for Quaker Oats with Wilford Brimley. And we still remember, you know, it helps prevent diabetes <laughs> or, or uh, whatever he said. I just remember the pronunciation. I don't even remember the full message, but, you know, he, he was a trustworthy figure. And so they continued carrying on that aspect of the brand loyalty. Right. And so choosing a source for your message is also a similar sort of consideration. Who is the face of this product? Who is the voice of this product at that is that consistent with the associations that people have with the brand? In the case of Wilford Brimley, what a perfect fit for a fictional character that this company created a hundred something years ago before they, before Wilford Brimley was born and his whole life, he was born to be the Quaker Oats man, right? <laughs> he was the guy for that role. People feel comfortable with what's familiar to them and familiarity can breed trust in a brand. At the same time, breaking from the norm is what helps brands stand out, get noticed, get people excited. What can a brand do to strike that balance between standing out 
from competitors, but also making sure that consumers feel they can trust the brand? That's a really good question. And I think most fundamentally, it's understanding consumer psychology. It's understanding who your customers are. If, if you are the kind of person that wants to be different, that wants to stand apart from the crowd, then you're more likely to be the kind of person that's going to be attracted to a brand that stakes their brand identity on doing the same thing. So knowing who your customer is, is, is really important. There are undoubtedly many products and many brands out there that, that probably depend in, to some degree uh, for their brand equity on being consistent and being reliable and being traditional. Once again, Coca-Cola is probably a very good example of that. I'm thinking about the, the Cola Wars in the 1980s and how Coca-Cola ended up in so much trouble with the failed launch of new Coke. You could argue that what happened in that case is that Coca-Cola thought that they could be Pepsi and they were wrong. Pepsi was the brand that stood up and said, you know what, we're not going to be Coca-Cola. Coke is consistent in a way that's reliable and trustworthy, but also mainstream and boring and yesterday's news. And we're going to be the choice of a new generation. So we're the brand for a different kind of consumer, the one that's not interested in drinking their grandparents' cola. They get Michael Jackson, who's the voice of a new generation, to in, to endorse, to so famously endorse the product and one of the most well-known television commercials of all time, set to Thriller. And Coca-Cola loses sight of who they are, right? They're so scared that Pepsi is coming for their market share that they feel like they have to go head-to-head -head with Pepsi without realizing that, you know what? Our brand equity is based on understanding who our core consumer is. And that consumer is not the same kind of person that Pepsi is trying to target. For companies like a Coca-Cola, they already dominate a percentage of the market, right? And then they see like a new part of the market emerge like Pepsi. Hey, we have this new generation that's coming up, but it's not necessarily our audience. And yet there's this temptation, like I'm missing out on, on all of these people, all of these new customers. Hmm. How does a company like balance that act of saying like, we still need to nurture our, our customer base but at the same time, we still need to reach out to new audiences so we can continue to grow and get more market share. That's a really good question. I think part of that is branding strategy, but maybe even more fundamentally, it's product strategy, right? So you need to launch new products into new markets and to growing markets without neglecting uh, well-established products in the marketplace that have long-term loyal customer bases. That's part of it. It's not so straightforward, right? Because you also have to consider factors like cannibalization. You have to be able to leverage your marketing resources in a sustainable way. So it's not like offering a tailor-made product to every possible consumer segment that you might be able to serve is going to be a sustainable strategy either. It really is a pretty delicate balancing act um, we could go back before the uh, new Coke failure and look at Coca-Cola responding to some of the health concerns that were emerging around sugar consumption in the 1970s and the 1980s and uh, developing Diet Coke, which was a huge success relative to the new Coke failure as an example of we're paying attention to the market. We're looking at where it's going. We're not neglecting our our, our core loyal customer base, but we do see opportunity here and we're going to launch a product into that market segment. I do think that branding is an important factor to consider too, because is it still Coca-Cola? Is it something else? Uh, how is the Diet Coke brand related to the Coca-Cola brand? Do we call it something else entirely? For reasons I don't fully understand, Coca-Cola had already developed Tab. It was branded uh, individually. It wasn't branded as part of the Coca-Cola family. 
So they clearly made a strategic branding decision in that case to brand the product in a way that maybe matched or resonated with what they knew about those particular customers. Maybe here is what it is. Those customers were not Coca-Cola customers. Maybe that's a strategy to target a market segment that in which they don't already have some share of the market. Whereas the Diet Coke strategy is really attending to the needs of your current customers and watching how their their patterns of behavior might be changing, right? There's always going to be Coke customers, but at, at any given time, some of those Coke customers might be transitioning to Diet Coke customers. So we want to make sure they know we're still the same company. It's still the same product. It's still the same Coca-Cola flavor and quality that you expect. But don't worry, it's not, at the same time, it's not Coca-Cola, right? This is a Coca-Cola product that is designed specifically for you. Well, we might have to disagree with the same taste. Yeah. <laughs> right. Bye, Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs>